praise you, Father, today. Does he reign today in your heart? And he reigns, he lives forevermore, amen? He is risen, he is alive, and he reigns today in our lives and in our hearts. He reigns over our situations, over our circumstances, in every area of our life. He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We just invite you today, Father, to visit us, and we thank you for visiting us and touching us. Even with, Lord Father, your touch today, we are strengthened to serve you, to seek you, and to find you with all our hearts. Thank you, Father, for being in our midst. And we pray now, Lord, that you would bless your word, Father, that it goes forth, Lord, and touches lives and changes hearts for your glory and your kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We serve an awesome Father today, and we just want to honor again our mothers. If you'll be turning in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. And again, we want to honor all of our moms and our mothers. Even if your mother is no longer living, we can still honor her memory. Amen. My mother passed away a few years ago. But we still remember the memory of our mother and what they taught us. Matter of fact, my mother taught me many, many godly virtues throughout my childhood that have stayed with me even to this day. I cannot imagine where I'd be without her. She taught me to pray. I can still hear, hear her saying, you better pray that that comes out of the carpet. <laughs> she instilled a sense of imagination in me. Don't do that again or else. Or I'd say, well, or else what? I just started imagining things. She taught me how to anticipate. Just you wait until your father comes home. She taught me how to count Matter of fact, at least one, two, and three. One, two, amen? She taught me repentance. Don't you ever do that again. And she taught me self-control. Don't touch anything. And then she even combined that with a little imagination, or else. But you know what? <laughs> Joking all aside, our mothers are special, amen? They're a special person that God created. And, you know, uh, us, us that aren't women, we're not mothers, we're fathers. But, uh, you know, when God created woman, he says, I'm going to make a help meet for you. He, he didn't say, I'm going to make a clone of you, right? God created woman, you know, as a, their own particular character and uh, their role in life, and their role is to love their children, amen, to raise them and to love them and care for them. There's nothing like the love of, of a mother, amen. God just puts some little special something in a woman that just has this care and this love for their children, and we honor them for that. Now, of course, for some, it's a bittersweet day, of course, you know, that some, you know, motherhood might have been an accident and not always welcome. And, you know, there's, there's different circumstances that, that goes on, but we know that God is in motherhood. Amen. There was a poem written by Wilhelm Busch. He said, to become a mother is not so difficult. On the other hand, being a mother is very much so. The Bible teaches us about being a godly woman in Proverbs 31. And we see the traits of God in every woman, but what stands out and what is different is a godly woman. Amen? A godly woman takes on all the roles and the love of God to show to their children. Real mothers are special people. 
Matter of fact, a real mother would like to be able to eat a whole candy bar all by themselves and drink a Coke without finding floaters in it. Real mothers have sticky floors, filthy ovens, and happy kids. Real mothers know that dried Play-Doh does not come out of shag carpet. <laughs> Some of you might be saying, what is shag carpet? We're just going to move on. Real mothers sometimes ask, why me? And they get this answer from this cute little voice that says, because I love you best, Mommy. Mm-hmm. It just breaks your heart, amen? It doesn't break it, but it wakes it. <laughs> But real mothers are an integral part of, you know, the family in our lives. And without mothers, as a matter of fact, none of us would be here. Right? Some of the greatest people in history told how important their mothers were. As a matter of fact, George Washington. Everybody know who George Washington was? He said, all I am I owe to my mother. This was so true about some of the greatest men in the Old Testament, as a matter of fact, about a man named Moses. Everything that he was, he owed to his two mothers. I'd like to show that clip, that video clip on Moses right now. Just to... What you call me? The answer to my prayers. You pray for a basket? No. I prayed for a son. Your husband is in the house of the dead. And he has asked the Nile God to bring me this beautiful boy. Do you know the pattern of this cloth? If my son is covered in it, it is a royal robe. Royal. It is the Levite cloth of a Hebrew slave. This child was put upon the water to save its life from your father's edict. I am the Pharaoh's daughter, and this is my son. He shall be reared in my house as the prince of the two lands. My mother and her mother before her were branded to the Pharaoh's service. I will not see you make this son of slaves a prince of Egypt. You will see it, Memnet. You will see him walk with his head among the eagles. You will serve him as you serve me. Fill the ark with water. Sink it into silence. But of the two people that fulfilled Moses' mother maternal role, they made certain choices in regards to Moses. And we also leave, our, our mothers leave a legacy with their children. Again, I want to preach on the man with two mothers today, and his name was Moses. And I want to point out the choices that they made. Con consider the choice of Jochebed. Moses was born in the culture of death at that time. As a matter of fact, the context or the decree of Pharaoh was that Moses should have been killed as soon as he was born. Imagine the pregnancy, imagine the waiting, the expectancy, the wondering whether the baby would be a girl or, or a boy. They didn't see, they didn't have ultrasound back then, so they couldn't, you know, discover if it was going to be a boy or a girl. They had to wait until the mother gave birth, and what she, when she gave birth, it says it was a goodly baby boy. The word goodly has the idea of being good and pleasant, agreeable and happy. In other words, he was a lovable baby boy. In his mother's eyes, he was perfect. How many of your kids were perfect? Still perfect, right? And don't let nobody else tell you they're not. Well, I'm telling you what. I seen, I seen Lisa. Oh, my word. I thought those people were going to get ground up and spit out. Like a, when they went against her kids. Uh-huh. And you know what I'm talking about. A mother's love, they'll defend their kids like nobody else. Hebrews 23 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was him months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. So you notice here it was both the mother and the father were complicit in this 
uh, deal of saving their son Moses because they seen that he was a goodly or a godly child. Exodus 2, verses 2 through 4 says, So the woman conceived for a son. She saw that he was a beautiful child. She hid him three months. But she no longer hide him. She took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood off far off to know what would be, co- what be done to him. Of course, others knew about Moses' mother was expecting, and she couldn't hide the fact for long, right, that she had, you know, she was pregnant, but now she's not, and where was that kid? But her faith in God sustained her and allowed her not to murder her son. Her faith in God was so great, she was willing to save her son and face the king's commandment that, they, that those boys would be put to death. Here's another mother who chose life. Sometimes in, you know, today, really, to be honest, the safest place should be the mother's womb, correct, for a baby. But consider this today about abortion. There's all, there was 42 million babies aborted last year in the world. 42 million. On an average, women give at least three reasons for choosing abortion. Three quarters have said the baby would interfere with work, school, or other responsibilities. About three quarters say they cannot afford a child. And a half say that they do not want to be a single parent or having problems with their husband or partner. The safest place should be in the mother's womb, amen? The Bible teaches us to care for our children, amen? In verse 5 and 6 in Exodus chapter 2, it says, Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to the bay at the river, and her handmaidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. So the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the riverside. And this was really Moses' second mother. Pharaoh's daughter seen the baby in the, in the little ark. And she had pity upon him. And she wanted a child. And she seen it as a gift from what to her was the gods. Amen? And she realized that it was a Hebrew baby. Immediately understood the circumstances and what was going to happen if she kept this child alive. But she said, she made a choice. She had compassion on him and saved him. Again, today we make that same choice with children, amen? Raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And, and what it says in the Bible that in, in, when they become older, they'll not depart from it. When we raise up our children and show them, you know, the things in the way of God, we need today to pray for our lawmakers. The, I mean, we have whole states today that are saying that you can go ahead and murder a child even after they're born. I can't even begin to imagine that. How, where is somebody's minds and thoughts when they do that? But we need to pray for our lawmakers that God will touch their hearts and speak to them and help them, those lost, our lost lawmakers that are ruling from a heart of evil instead of a heart of good. But thank God for the women that choose life. We applaud you and we praise the Lord. Death would have been easier for these two mothers, but they said, no, we're going to provide for this child, and we're going to, because we know that it is a life. I mean, today they're even saying that with a heartbeat, I mean, obviously it had nothing to do with being a heartbeat or being conceived in the womb, because now they're saying it's all right to kill a child when they're born. So what is a child? Is it a life or is it not a life? Is it a child of God or is it not? So it had nothing to do with conception or any of those things. That used to define if it was a baby. A baby's a baby. Amen? 
Verses 7 and 9 in Exodus 2, it says, Then the sister, his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew woman, that she may nurse the child for you? In verse 8, it says, And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take his child away. Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. You know what's really amazing about this story? Is that the, the mother, the biological mother of Moses, took this child, made an ark. Did you catch that word, ark? Put pitch on it so it would not leak. Put the baby in it. And put it in the river. Really, she was putting it in the hands of God. And that river took the baby away. She had to trust in God at that point. And just look at this story. The daughter of Pharaoh came and found this child as it was coming down the river and picked it up. She wanted a child. You know, it was really God that changed her heart to keep this child. So she takes the child out of the river and says, I, that is my child. And he, we know the story that Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house. But think about this. Pharaoh's daughter called for the child's mother to care for it. So God brought the child back to the mother that gave it away and released it. She said, sometimes we have to let go and let God and at the right time, God brings it back. Amen? But we have to put our faith and our trust in Him. But the love for Moses was shown in, by these two women. And God raised up a mighty man in, in Moses. The princess loved Moses because God had changed her heart, really. She named him Moses, which means drawn out. He was drawn out of the river. This name is also a really amazing thing for Moses, drawn out. It says that he was drawn out from others. He was set aside by God. And it's really hard really to not face the irony of this situation. Pharaoh had to pay for the upkeep of the child he had ordered to be murdered. He had to raise up Moses, who was going to end up being the deliverer of the, of the Israelites from the Egyptians. See, sometimes God will place us in the enemy's house and He'll let us be raised up in the midst of them even with, the, you know, with their blessing because God has a plan and a purpose. Sometimes we're, we're put in the enemy's camp and the enemy's court and so that God can use us for His glory. Let's just make it simple. It says in Psalms 115.3, it says, But our God is in heaven. And he does what he wants. For Psalms 135 and 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth. In the seas and all the deep places. You see, our heavenly father, he reigns. And he does whatever he pleases and whatever he wants. Sometimes we might say, man, it looks chaotic out there and I don't quite understand it. But when we have a, a heart and a faith for God, no matter what happens, we, when we put our faith and our trust in him, we know that he will lead us and guide us every step we take. No matter what we face, no matter what we go through. And sometimes we go through trials and patience that really tries our faith and challenges us. Because he does it on purpose, because his word says that the trying of our faith is much more precious than silver and gold. God put love for this child in the hearts of two vastly different women. God spared Moses from a certain death, and he had a plan for this man's life, as we know, according to Acts 7:29. It says the same dealt sub subtly with our kindred and evil and treated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceedingly fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. You see, even in the midst of evil, God raises up men and women. Amen. 
If you were born into a family where you received love, you should rejoice. And if you've been loved you should, and you are blessed, amen? The Bible tells us also that when, we're, when we are without mother or father, he will be the father to the fatherless. On August 16, 1987, Northwest Airlines Flight 225, I don't think they have that flight anymore at Northwest, but just after taking off from the Detroit airport, the plane went down and killed 155 people. One child survived, a four-year-old from Temp, Arizona, named Sicily. When rescuers found her, they did not believe that she had not been killed. Investigators first assumed she had not been a passenger, but maybe just hanging out there on the tarmac. But anyways, they asked her, how did, how did you survive? Well, you see... Her mother unbuckled her own seatbelt, got down on her knees in front of her daughter, wrapped her arms and body around her, and then would not let go of her. Nothing can separate that child from parents' love. Neither tragedy nor disaster, neither the, the failing or the flames that follow, neither height nor depth can separate us from the love of God. And nothing can separate the love for a child from her mother, amen? Thank God for the love of parents. Genuine parental love is a window into the very heart of God. Now both of these mothers gave Moses and they invested into him with their lives. His Egyptian mother gave him the best Egypt had to offer. It says in Acts 7, 21 and 22, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her, her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and in deed. See, Moses received the best education, the best that Egypt had to offer because God was raising up a man who was going to be used of God to deliver his people, the Israelites, out of the hands of the Egyptians. Can you just imagine the irony again of this situation? You see, God just does what he wants. Maybe today, maybe you're thinking, Lord, why am I in this situation that I am in? Why am I going through this trial or this struggle? I don't understand it. But you see, we don't always have to understand what God is doing because the Bible says, lean not onto your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him. Just go ahead and acknowledge, Lord, I know that you're, uh, you're the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and I don't understand what I'm going through, but I acknowledge that you are the King of kings and that you are doing this for a reason, and you know what's best for me. I'm not going to lean upon my own understanding of this situation because I know that you have a plan and a purpose. And what I'm going through is for a plan and a purpose. And you're going to lead me and direct my footsteps. You see, the sooner that we realize that God is in control of our lives, the sooner we will have peace with what is happening around us. The sooner we're going to realize that as long as we've prayed and as long as we have done what God has told us to do, we can't always you know, rely upon what's happening around us, but we have to rely upon our sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit of God, where he's taking us and leading us. By the time Moses was grown, he understood that God could use him to deliver his people from slavery. Acts 7, 24 through 29 says, And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended them, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would not set them again. But he said, My brethren, why do you do wrong one to another? But that he did his, to his neighbor. Why are you doing wrong? 
Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? His brother and said, Wilt thou kill me like you did the Egyptian the other day? Then Moses fled. We know about really Moses on the backside of a desert for 40 years. How many of you feel like you've been on the backside of the desert for a long time? You see, sometimes God puts us on the backside of a desert because he's raising up and training us. We don't always receive all of our education and all of our training in the riches of Egypt, but sometimes we have to go to the desert to learn some of our, tra some of our training and our education because God puts us there so that we rely totally upon him. You see, Moses didn't always know where he was going, but God knew where he was going, and he was leading him. This is the wonderful thing about God. And here's a wonderful thing that we need to understand as parents, as mothers and fathers. Me and, me and my lovely wife, Lisa, she is so gorgeous. This is one thing that we strove to teach our children. Wasn't necessarily, we didn't teach them, you know, how to balance a checkbook, right? Still ain't got that, okay. We didn't, we didn't necessarily strive for them to be the smartest kids on the block. We didn't strive for them to you know, have all of this and all of that and everything. But one thing we strove for is that they would be in church, that they would know God, and that they would give their lives to Him. That was our utmost goal in raising our children. And that is the most important thing, right? Is that they know Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives. See, today we live kind of in a culture that is counterculture to the Word of God and to raising children. There's really a counterculture today that today it's getting worse and worse. Amen? Amen? Can I, can I, what did I just say? Counterculture? Can you say that? Counterculture? Can you say it's Mother's Day? Amen. Well, here's, uh, here's Chuck Swindoll. Anybody heard of Chuck Swindoll? He gave the following insight on how to raise your child to be a delinquent. Okay? It's kind of like uh, uh, Steve Harvey for the rest of the story. Now, here's the rest of the story. But anyways, let me go back to Chuck Swindoll. When your kid is still an infant, give him everything he wants. This way he'll think the world owes him a living when he grows up. When he picks up swearing and off-color jokes, laugh at him. Encourage it. As he grows up, he'll pick up cuter phrases that will floor you. Never give him any spiritual training. Wait until he's 21 and let him decide for himself. Avoid using the word wrong. It will give your child a guilt complex. You can condition him to believe later when he is arrested for stealing a car that society is against him and he is being persecuted. Pick up after him his books, shoes, and clothes. Do everything for him so he'll be experienced in throwing all responsibility onto others. Let him read all printed material he can get his hands on. Never think of monitoring his TV programs. Sterilize the silverware, but let him feast his mind on garbage. Quarrel frequently in his presence. Then he won't be too surprised when his home is broken up later. Satisfy his ever craving for food, drink, and comfort. Every sensual desire must be gratified. Denial may lead to harmful frustrations. Give your child all the spending money they want. Don't make him earn his own. Why should he have things It's too tough out there already? Make, take his side against neighbors, teachers, and policemen. They're all against him, right? 
And then the last thing it says, prepare for a life of grief. The book of Proverbs tells us the same thing, right? Spare the rod and spoil the child. Spare the rod and spoil the child. We have to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Let's stand today. You see, God providentially prepared Moses for his role as deliverer of Israel. Through these two women, he gave their influence made Moses the man he was and the man he became. Today it's again an honor to honor our mothers for all that they've done for us. The little things that we ignore at times or don't see. You see, a mom's constant concern is for the welfare of their children. We as kids don't always see that, right? That that's really what their concern is for. But today... I wonder if you would say I'd like to lift up my child again before the Lord and pray for them that the Lord would guide them and lead them and just think about all that you've invested all that you've put into their lives if you've placed the word of God in their heart you placed his word because there's nothing more important than our children coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and that's what many of us strive for and believe for in our children let's just pray today right now for our children mothers if Let's go ahead and let's lift up our children before the Lord. Father, we thank you today. Lord, we might not have always been the best example. And Father, we never, I, 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 I don't, I, Lord, me and, me and Lisa never had a, never had a, a textbook other than your word. And we learned a lot of things, probably more things from our kids than what we taught them. But Father, we love them. And Lord, we pray for them today that your spirit and your presence would be in their lives. Lord, that your grace would be upon their hearts. Lord, just help us today as we pray for our children to be godly men and women and godly parents. Father, if we need to, Father, sometimes go past, Lord, the, the rules of this world that say don't do this or don't do that when it's in direct opposition to your word. Father, today we choose life. And we choose your word and your will and your way in raising our kids. Father, your wisdom, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord.